It's time for Morning Today with Jonathan Mark on AM 1480 WLEA. You know, I kind of like that intro. That's really nice, nice and positive. Well, good morning. It is Tuesday morning at 8.05 approximately. We see 8.05-ish. Uh, kind of gloomy out there, overcast, a little bit of rain in the forecast, but that's okay because it is spring. Well, I was, you know, a show like this, you can't really do any kind of a plan in pen. You need a pencil because things change real quick. So I do everything in pencil. Uh, I wasn't going to lead off with this, but I guess I will. It's kind of interesting. That word came uh, this morning, actually overnight, that Woodstock 50 has been canceled. Now, that was going to be a big money maker in the Watkins Glen area, which is a good thing. Making money is a very, very good thing. And organizers were planning on making tens of millions of dollars off this thing. But apparently, the financial backers have backed out. So they say, well, maybe it's not really going to make all that much money, and we'll just, like, never mind and do it else, but, but, but sometime else or something. And it's, it's kind of interesting because the organizer of the event, uh, what's his name, Michael Lang, who was the co-founder of the original Woodstock in 1969, said that, oh, no, well, it doesn't really wouldn't live up to the Woodstock brand, whatever the Woodstock brand is. So it's, you know, it's too bad that they're going to lose out on this money in the Watkins Glen area because it really is a fun, you know, music is a fun thing. Everybody likes music and the concert's always a nice thing. But I see a couple of really odd things about this. In the first place, the original Woodstock, many, many, many years, last century sometime, 1969, uh, it was the, I guess you might call it the high water mark, <laughs> if you want to call it that, of the 60s was Woodstock. That was the big deal. That was the big one. And Woodstock was the culmination of everything that people who lived in the 60s thought were really important. Uh, rejected all material things, rejected money, rejected all that their parents stood for. Hard work, trying to make something of yourself, and doing something with your life. And they rejected all that. And that was their big deal was Woodstock. And so now, 50 years later, when they're going to have this recreation of that wonderful, wonderful time in our history, which of course it wasn't, uh, the financial backers have backed out because it will make enough money. So go figure that. There's got to be a whole bunch of permutations there. But the concert... That was the rallying cry of the anti-establishment generation. The recreation of that has been canceled because it won't make any money or not enough money. So I think that's kind of interesting. And I don't know. I think maybe, I don't know. I think the 60s were just a sham, if I may be so bold. It was just a sham. And that generation of the 60s, became pretty money hungry. So they went against all their ideals, or most of them, over the years, and it became a pretty greedy generation. Those who were out there dressed like, I don't know, oh, I don't know, like they were at a carnival or something, or some the circus people, you know, nothing wrong with circus people, but everybody just, you know. <laughs> uh, some of my best friends are circus people. Well, okay, fine. Well, okay. They hate the clowns are fun, you know. Uh, so it looks like, you know, they look like they bought their clothes at a local clown store, okay? And it's funny that now we won't make enough money. I, I, th I think that's pretty interesting. I think we, what we ought to do is leave 1969 far behind us, way, 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 way behind us, and move forward from here. At least that's my, my feeling. Uh, and you're, you're actually, I'm, I'm someone who was in the 60s. But even at the time, you saw that there was nothing but a sham. I mean, the emperor had no clothes. Really, it was just, it was, it, it was nothing but a, a ripoff. The, the entire thing was a ripoff. But well, on we go. Maybe they'll have another Woodstock thing at some point. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Anyway, uh, before I do anything else, that's right. 
I was going to mention this a couple of days ago or last week, and I didn't get around to it. The move over law, an entirely different subject. This, that's what I mean. This whole show is in pencil. The move over law. Now, the move over law, as any of our listeners know, especially if you drive a car, is if you're driving down the road and you come upon a disabled vehicle in the right-hand lane, or maybe a crew is working there, or maybe some law enforcement official has stopped the car and they're, you know, giving a ticket or talking to the driver or something. You're supposed to move over and give them room, which I think is an absolutely wonderful idea because there have been a lot of real tragic accidents when people do not move over and are just not using their heads. And it's a great idea in theory, but in implementation, it's a little harder Because this has happened to me, as a matter of fact, a number of times on on 21, uh, going to uh, Alamed or Alfred or something, is you, as a responsible driver, you are going to move over, okay? You will give a wide berth or a semi-wide berth to somebody on the side of the road. But let's say that the schmo coming the other way is thinking of something else, or they don't feel like moving over. (laughs) Then what do you do? So now you are essentially halfway in their lane. And they're not moving. What do you do then? I mean, there's there's a possibility of some something really bad happening there. And what brought it up was I was driving down the 21 last week or two weeks. I don't remember when it was. But I moved over because there was a crew working on electrical lines. And they were out there doing whatever they do. They had ladders out or a bucket truck or something. And, you know, they're, they're doing this stuff. So I move over to give them a room. And some guy is coming the other way, and he's not moving over. So all this takes place in about three seconds, probably maybe less. I'm giving them room, moving around them like that, and here comes the car head on. We are about two and a half seconds from a head-on crash. This guy wasn't going to move. I mean, he, he had no intention of moving. And if I had gone just, just a snidge more, it would have been a head-on crash. So I had a quick hit it and punch it and go, and, and go back in the driving lane. And this guy just went, just went sailing right by. And I go, man, if I hadn't moved, I would have been in the middle of a pretty big news story. You don't, you don't, want, you don't want to make a news story of yourself, you know? So it, it depends on everybody being on the same page. And it's, re, I mean, it's required. It is the law. You have to move over. If you don't move over, you can get a ticket. Or you might possibly wind up at a head-on crash if the guy coming the other way is an idiot, you know? So you have, you have to be really careful with that and keep it in mind especially at this time of year when a lot of construction, well, this, this is sort of a different thing, but a lot of construction going on. And I happen to know somebody personally who was a flagger for a construction company. And she has told me some really horrific, I mean, just horrific stories about people who do not use their head at construction sites. If a flagger's out there, they're not out there just, you know, taking up time. I mean, they're doing a really, really important job. And if a flagger says stop or slow down or go or do something, you have to listen to what the flagger is doing. And you know, a lot of people in construction over the years have gotten hurt, seriously hurt, if not worse, because drivers just don't really use their head. If somebody's out there flagging, listen or watch what they're doing and you know, listen to what they're telling you to do. Stop, go, this, that, you know. So that, that too is important, especially so at this time of year. A lot of construction going on all over, all over New York State, not just here, but all over. So I just thought I mentioned those two things, the move over law, which is a very good idea. Um, yeah, the move over law and watch flaggers at construction sites because they're, they're, you know, they know what they're doing. Um, so I just thought I'd mention that too. Now, there are a number of stories in the news recently. And, you know, I just mentioned this last, when? Last Friday, about how religion is under attack. Figuratively and literally, I mean literally under attack. And you have to wonder what in the world is going on here. We've had shootings at churches, that huge thing in Sri Lanka last week, I think it was, where hundreds of people were killed. We've had attacks on mosques, 
and the, the temples, synagogues. I mean, what, what is going on here? So it is literally under attack. And why the spate of bombings and shootings and all that, you just wonder what is going through people's minds. I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. But it's, it's becoming more and more common. And man, it's just getting worse. You know, I think there are a lot of religions. And people should be left alone to worship God in however they want to. You know, what, whatever way you want to, you just go for it, you know. Um, I don't know. It's something I think that people really ought to think about. And coming up this week, this is Tuesday. On Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. And I have some notes on the National Day of Prayer. Here we are. 1952, uh, Harry Truman declared a National Day of Prayer. Except I don't think he specified what day, but there should be one national day of prayer. And that was in 1952, so that was a long time ago. And then in 1988, President Reagan declared the first Thursday in May, which will be this Thursday, as the national day of prayer. And I think probably it will be a good idea to go and pray. No matter how, how and no matter where, it would be a very good idea to pray because I think it's necessary, and it's becoming more and more so, especially recently. So however, however you want to, Thursday is a national day of prayer. I think uh, a little prayer goes a long way, and a little insurance is always a good idea. So I think prayer is a really good idea, and let's just try to do something on this, this Thursday, this, this day of prayer. Now, let me see, this is Tuesday. This is Tuesday. In my book, it is the worst day of the week, week is Tuesday. Tuesday. The, I think the best that can be said about Tuesday is at least it's not Monday. Okay, but we still have the entire work week ahead of us. The weekend's long gone. Monday is gone. Now it's nothing but work for a day or two anyway. So Tuesday, I think, is the worst day of the work, work week. Uh, as I said, uh, at, least, at least it's not Monday. It could be worse. So, anyway, here we are on the 30th, the, right, the 30th, yeah, the, uh, the second day of the week, Tuesday, and here we, and here we go, we just lost stuff here. Okay, here we are. Uh, let me see, oh, yes, speaking about work, this is from Best Life. I never heard of it, but it's some website called Best Life. And the headline is, this is the number one reason Americans are stressed at work. Now, why would Americans be stressed at work? Well, there are a number of possibilities. At least according to the article here, of course, we all have, let me see, how about co-workers who you don't like or who don't like you? You don't get along with them. How about difficult bosses? Hmm, anybody ever experienced that, a difficult boss? I can't think of anybody. Uh, how about long hours? Work is a huge source of anxiety for Americans, it says here. But based on new research from search platform Comparably, that's the name of capital C, Comparably, there is one work stressor that prevails above the rest, and it's probably not what you think. Comparably polled nearly 21,000 American. Wow, comparably polled nearly 21,000 Americans of all ages, professions, educational backgrounds, ethnicities, and experience levels at small, mid-sized, and large companies. That probably covers everything. Anyway, they asked the participants six questions about their job anxieties, and they found that. Are you ready? Having unclear goals was what the majority of people listed as their main source of stress at work. Unclear goals. And, go like so, here it is, a staggering, a staggering 41% of Americans cited unclear goals as the main reason they were stressed at work, according to the poll. Let me see, 16% uh, of workers get anxious over their commute or a bad boss. It's a tie. And in third place, 13% of participants said long hours are their top source of anxiety. But the main thing was, it was unclear goals. And oddly enough, I thought this was really weird. Okay, so you go for a job, and you say, oh, you know, I want to work here. And so you get a job. When you went to get a job, didn't you know what the job entailed? 
how, how could you have unclear goals? I'm hiring you, says the uh, HR. I'm going to hire you, and here's your job. And then you're stressed because you have unclear goals. Don't you know what your job is? You'd think you'd know if you went for a job that you'd know what your job is, I think. But what's even more surprising is this concern is most prevalent among executives. Where 62% of respondents listed it as their top concern. Now, these are executives. You'd think if you'd be an executive in a company, you'd know what, what, your, what your job is, right? So, in other words, all these executives and bosses are running around. They don't know what they're doing either. I mean, is that, is that what they're telling us here? Is that what they're telling us here? Six and two executives don't have a clue what their goal is. <laughs> That, that's a, that doesn't really speak too highly, I think, of executives. But anyway, that's what this poll found. So I guess um, I guess if you want to find fulfillment, you know, if you're looking for fulfillment at work, you'll never find it. Because fulfillment is not at work. Okay, that's A number one. I think everybody understands that. Gee, I'm not fulfilled at my job. Well, that's, that's, that's not your job. Your job is to do your job. You want fulfillment, you have to find it elsewhere. But, you know, if you have a job, you, you really should have some kind of a clear goal. And if you don't have one, I'd say ask your boss, but then he might not have a clear idea of what his goal is. It gets pretty complicated. I think we're going to take a break, and we'll be back after these words. New to golf or a seasoned veteran? You'll enjoy the casual, relaxed atmosphere of Vanderview Golf Course. Two miles from downtown Alfred on Waterwells Road, Vanderview is a nine-hole, executive-length golf course with a driving range on one side of the road and the course on the other. Family-friendly and fun recreation for everyone. You can walk the course or use a cart. And new this year, a season pass for only $100. That's a lot of golf fun for a very little bit of money. Vanderview Golf Course, two miles from downtown Alfred on Waterwells Road. Okay, now Brian was just talking. Okay, now what was this about now? Okay, about during Governor the break, Cuomo? I was uh, telling Jonathan that Governor Andrew Cuomo has issued a statement about the Simpsons cartoon. Okay, wait. The, you, 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 the Simpsons? Yes. Don't. Don't. Yes. Really? Okay. And what? What? What's the statement about? Well, the he's criticizing the show. Okay. But th this okay. is a little bit different because than you might expect because The Simpsons slammed upstate New York. What? Can I read the story from the New York Post? Well, yeah, I suppose. Okay. okay in this episode, a recent episode of The Simpsons, uh, it says that uh, I'm reading from the New York Post here. Homer says, we're headed to a one place that can never decline because it was never that great. Upstate New York. What? What? Really? So during the trip, this is from the post. During the trip, a tractor trailer is seen swallowed by a pothole. <laughs> they pass a shutdown Kodak plant in Rochester as people snap selfies on their phones. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So Rich Ezra Petey, uh, who's uh, one of the um, big names in the Cuomo administration, issued a statement saying, There always remains work to be done, but dumb cheap shots aside, facts are facts. Jobs are up and upstate. Unemployment's down. Millennials are coming back. And it's clear that Pucci was an uncredited writer on that episode. <laughs> ha, So Governor Cuomo takes on uh, The Simpsons, eh? <laughs> okay, well, you know, I think The Simpsons are probably done in Los Angeles. I, I would imagine the the a, a cartoon show. I have Governor Cuomo says uh, no disrespect to The Simpsons, but no, he does not watch it. Uh, but he's going to write a letter to The Simpsons. So, <laughs> so how does he know if he doesn't watch The Simpsons? I think Richester Petey might be a viewer. Oh, okay. So The Simpsons, you know, knowing what Los Angeles is like. Uh, they have no room to talk, okay? I think I'd <laughs> much rather be in upstate New York than in Los Angeles. So there you go. That's why I'm here and not there. So I don't know what they're talking about. Up, upstate really is coming back. At least in this area it is. 
you know, that this is where we live, and I, I think it's coming back. So, <laughs> a little yeah. unusual for the governor to weigh in on a Simpsons episode, but in this Probably circumstance, not, no, you can see no. why. Well, I could see where he would be incensed and write a letter to the uh, Simpsons. Uh, Homer Simpson or the creator? Mark, of I'm the, not sure. I, I guess Homer's the one that said it. Aha, uh-huh. okay, so it's it's Homer's fault. No, that's fine. All right, okay. Uh, where were we? Uh, we were gonna take. Were we gonna take a break here, Brian? At we some could. Point? Yes. Okay. We'll be back. From the Fox Business Network, Boeing admits there's another issue with its 737 MAX jets. Following a report in the Wall Street Journal, the company says some safety alerts were not functioning as expected. The alert is supposed to notify pilots that the MCAS stall prevention system may be about to misfire. Google's parent company, Alphabet, is reporting slower growth for the start of the year. It's partly blamed on competition, but also Google was fined $1.7 billion by European regulators in the period after it was accused of abusing its search engine in Europe. Domino's wants you to be able to track your pizza by GPS. Nation's Restaurant News says Domino's is testing a new system in Arizona that shows the location of your pizza delivery driver. The Dow was up 11 yesterday. NASDAQ added 15. S&P gained 3. With the Fox Business Report, I'm Ginny Cosola. Hey, my friend's retail store was the victim of IoT password theft. Yep. Cyber criminals are taking over security cameras, payment systems, and other IoT devices by exploiting vulnerabilities. What if they target us and our dispersed network? We're secured with Barracuda. We have advanced firewalls for our sites, enhanced security for our cloud infrastructure, and total email protection. Such a relief. Protect your business at Barracuda.com. Barracuda, your journey secured. Justify a two-length lead as they come to the final 16. Good magic on the outside is second. Audible third for the inside. They're coming to the wire. Justify has won the Kentucky Derby. Is there another Justify among this year's Kentucky Derby field? This is Mike Penna from Horse Racing Radio Network. Join us this Saturday live from Churchill Downs for exclusive audio coverage of the 145th Kentucky Derby right here on NBC Sports Radio and Westwood One. Saturday on AM 1480 WLEA. The Kentucky Derby right here on WLEA. Isn't that cool? Wow. We, you had to the Masters a couple of weeks ago. Now the Kentucky Derby, looking up. Very, very good. You know, I lived uh, briefly, I lived about six months in Culpeper in Virginia in 1973 and boy was it hot and humid oh man wow we and, and th- this was the spring and the well the spring of the summer yeah, it was it was pretty hot but it was the 1973 it rings a bell that's right it's the year that secretariat won the kentucky derby and i had never had any kind of contact at all with horse racing it just it didn't interest me it, it still really doesn't but the kentucky derby is different that is really majorly big stuff and now this was in Virginia, in Northern Virginia, and the Kentucky Derby is, duh, in, in the Kentucky. But it was madness. I had never seen anything like it. Every ad for every product in every business, all day, 24 hours a day, was nothing but the Derby. I mean, it, it was madness. I'd never seen anything like it. But these people are seriously, seriously in a horse racing down south. And... Uh, Wow, I remember that very well. And when Secretary won, it was pandemonium. I mean, even the, even in Virginia, miles and miles away, it was really, really big thing. Oh, one, oh, we're running out of time. I was going to do the contest. I'll do the contest tomorrow. Um, 1976, I had never been to a racetrack. And I thought, you know, I think I'll go to a racetrack here in western New York. So I figure, how do people dress when they go to a racetrack? Well, let me see. I really don't know. So I bought... I bought a white suit. I mean, this baby, this puppy was white. I had white shoes. I had white pants, uh, slacks, a white jacket, a white tie, and a white shirt. Okay? And I must have looked like an idiot. So I buy this suit. Remember the old Murray Stevens? Remember the old Murray Stevens? Yep. That's where I bought it. An entirely white suit, and I never went. Now I was stuck with the white suit, which I would never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, wear, ever. So I was stuck with a stupid white suit. I wound up wearing it to a wedding, which I kind of, you know, at a wedding, it's, you know, it's okay. But 
So that was my one experience with horse racing. I bought a suit and, and never went. So that's all I know about racing, and we, we seem to be out of time to. Now, see, I was going to do this contest, but I guess I'll do it tomorrow morning. Oh, wait till you hear. It's a pip, and I'll see you tomorrow at 8.05. Bye. City Dodge in Hornell. Drive away.